Good afternoon, everyone. If there are any other speakers for this session, could you please come up and sit on the platform, please, so we can all look at you. <laughs> One, two, three, four. So there should be six speakers in this session. Oh, well, oh okay. See that we're going to have a couple of seconds. Yeah. wandering back again. Um, three things. Yes. Oh, really? Mm, I know. It could be almost in a smaller room. Yeah, you might as well sit. Okay, I, I can sit here. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we'll get started. Um, I'm meant to be one of the co-chairs here today with David Lau, but he hasn't uh, shown up yet. He might be arriving soon. He might be stuck in another meeting or something, but that's okay. I'm Laurie Twells. I'm an associate professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland, and I'm delighted to be co-chairing or chairing this session here this afternoon, the clinicals uh, three. Uh, we have six very interesting and exciting speakers that will be giving you a 10-minute presentation uh, allowing for five minutes for questions or a 12-minute presentation with three minutes for questions. But either way, we'll be trying to keep the time to 15 minutes. Um, in terms of questions, if people do want to ask questions, please uh, make your way up to the microphone so that we can hear you, as well as stating your name before you actually ask your question as well. And the first speaker today is going to be Miss Jennifer Donnan, who's actually one of my colleagues. Uh, from Memorial University, and Jennifer is going to be speaking to you about patient preferences toward characteristics to be used in prioritizing patients for bariatric surgery, a discrete choice experiment. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Thank you to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. This is a really exciting project for us and our team um, because this is a patient identified issue. They identify that access to bariatric surgery is very limited and maybe it warrants some of our attention. 
And so we actually looked at patient preferences towards how we might be able to prioritize patients on a wait list. And to do that, we used a discrete choice experiment. So just uh, in terms of disclosures, we're, we're supported through our Newfoundland Support Unit, which is our patient-oriented research um, center. And I have a CIHR fellowship as well. Uh, so with respect to our rationale, I mean, I think we're all aware here that patients with severe obesity, when it comes to uh, therapeutic interventions, bariatric surgery is probably the most effective for weight loss, uh, sustained weight loss. So we know that other interventions, w uh, whether it's pharmacological or lifestyle interventions, do work, but weight tends to come back, whereas bariatric surgery does lead to some sustained weight loss. Um, however, access to bariatric surgery is quite limited. So the guidelines actually indicate that anybody who has a BMI greater than 40 or a BMI greater than 35 and a comorbidity can have access to care or are eligible for care uh, with the surgery program. But it's on a first come first serve basis. And we know that those with uh, severe and complex obesity in our province is about 8% is quite a number. And so uh, what happens is we have a s demand that's far greater than supply and only about 1% of our eligible population gets surgery each year. And wait times can be then up to about five years. So this is a patient identified issue to, to address this uh, access. So our objective was to quantify preference weights for attributes of individuals waiting for bariatric surgery and to support a more objective prioritization. And so if anybody happened to see me present uh, this morning, I did a Pecha Kucha, that was the qualitative piece that's leading into this quantitative piece um, of this study. I'll take a second before I describe our methods and results just to step back and say what is a discrete choice experiment because I know it's a method that's not always familiar to the audiences that I present to you um, and so I just want to make sure that I don't lose you before I move too far into my presentation. So a discrete choice experiment is a study design that's um, in a choice modeling design so it means that we're able to explore in more detail how people make choices. Um, so it's founded or grounded in multi-attribute utility theory, which means that when we make choices, no matter what it is, how we get to work, how we choose our coffee, we're going to look at that choice and break it down by several attributes, um, make some trade-offs, and then pick whatever choice gives us the most utility or the most benefit at that point in time. So let's just consider this example. You're at work, you have a headache, and you say, which pain relief medication should I choose based on these alternatives? So you have drug A, drug B, or alternative A and B. And you might think about uh, likelihood of response, time to effect, cost, or risk of stomach upset, for instance. And then you can see in these alternatives, alternative A is actually uh, much, performs much better in terms of likelihood of response and risk of stomach upset, but alternative B performs better on those other attributes. And so you have to make trade-offs. Um, and when we do this and we present these choice tasks to study participants over and over again, we can run a regression model to see exactly quantify how much of the, each of these attributes influence the choices people make. And so some languages that I'll use going forward, attributes, so these things that describe choices um, are attributes, and then levels or descriptors are how each one of these alternatives performs. So what we tried to do then is for our study is we wanted to give patients in the community a survey and ask them which patient, patient A or B, do you think should have access to bariatric surgery first? And we would describe those based on characteristics. So into our methods, first thing we had to do was to define what attributes and levels were important or for drivers of decision here. And so to do this, we did a qualitative assessment, uh, we did a literature review, and we also conducted fo focus groups with patients in our province using a nominal group technique. And from there, we were able to come up with six attributes that were considered important, and each of those have three to four levels. And I'll bring those up in a minute. For survey design, we used a specialized software that enables us to do these choice modeling uh, designs. And we created 12 tasks that will go to each uh, participant in the survey. And we also collected some demographic information. With data collection, we actually worked with Research Now, which is a, a marketing research company that enabled us to collect responses from right across the country. So we collected just over 500 responses from Canadian adults with a BMI of 35 or greater. And for our analysis, we used the descriptive statistics for those basic uh, population characteristics. And for the discrete choice portion, we used a multinomial logit model. So the results of our um, 
the qualitative piece uh, is basically presented here. These are the attributes and levels we figured were the most important for driving decisions. These included BMI, number of cardiovascular comorbidities, number of other comorbidities, um, impact of obesity on mental health and daily activities, and then wait time, so how long a person's actually been waiting to get the surgery. And then we came up with realistic levels that really reflect wait times, BMIs, number of medical conditions, um, et cetera. And for mental health and daily activities, we actually use the EQ5D um, criteria. So this was a sample choice task that would have appeared in our survey, and again, they had 12 of these. Um, so as you can see, patient A and patient B, in some situations, the patient might have a sicker health profile and other uh, whereas patient B is healthier, and then in other characteristics, the other patient might be sl considered slightly worse off. So there's some trade-offs people make when they try to identify which patient um, should maybe get quicker access to care. Um, for our baseline characteristics, I won't go through these in detail, just to say that they are fairly representative, but I will highlight that actually the employment status surprised me a little bit. Um, because we actually have about 15% of our sample were unemployed for medical reasons, which I thought was probably a little high. Now, they didn't say that it was specifically obesity related, but, um, you know, we can make some assumptions there that perhaps um, it is. In terms of weight loss history, as you can imagine, most of our sample had tried some sort of weight loss strategy in the past and through a variety of mechanisms. And about 15% of our sample had actually lost over 80 pounds on one of those attempts. Uh, and 40% of our population had at least considered surgery as a potential uh, solution. So this is the main results of the discrete choice piece. So this is the regression. These are the, the weighted um, uh, estimates for each level of each attribute. So I'll walk through how to interpret this. If we see a negative number here, uh, it means that this level of this attribute negatively uh, influence choice, so they were more likely not to choose that. If it's a positive number, the respondent was more likely to choose an alternative with this attribute. And then we, when we consider the absolute value, this is the degree to which it influenced choice. So um, here, highlighted in green, we'll see the four attributes that were actually most influential. And so the top, the number one criteria was actually um, problems with daily activities. So this was considered most important in selecting a patient for a priority, followed by number of cardiovascular comorbidities, um, impact on mental health, and then other comorbidities. What's really interesting are those highlighted in red. And so these are the attributes considered least important. Now they were still significant and still influenced choice, but it was by far less important than these other characteristics. And those are BMI and wait time, which is interesting because those are the only criteria that we use at the moment in terms of access to bariatric surgery. So what our patients are telling us is that all these other things are far more important than what's being used currently. So in terms of clinical implications, what does this research tell us? Well, we have a high level, patients place a high level of importance on the overall clinical picture, not just size or, you know, BMI. This is actually the second study in Canada to demonstrate some of this, these trends in findings anyway. It was a different, um, there was a study in Alberta that looked uh, at the same issue, but used a different methodology, and they were finding the same things, that basically it's the broader clinical picture that's most important. This study, what it adds is that it quantifies those preference weights, um, so we can really see which is the most important. And in terms of how it supports clinical practice and research, well, we're really hoping that this is the first step in supporting an equitable prioritization strategy. And so we'd love to create a waitlist tool that maybe would help surgeons put patients on their waitlist. But first, I think what we'll need to do is maybe identify um, ways we can objectively measure, say, uh, mental health and daily activities, because it's easy to say numbers of co cardiovascular comorbidities, it's harder to measure mental health. So I think there's a little bit more work we can do to help objectively um, assess patients, but certainly this is a big step forward in terms of being able to make this possible. Limitations. Uh, this is, when we talk about choice modeling, you can either do stated preference or reveal preference. Reveal preference is actually looking at, say, market data and how, what patients or people, what choices they make, what cars they buy. Um, where stated preference is giving people these, like, hypothetical scenarios and asking them to choose. And so there are some, um, some inherent biases, although we tend, I don't think they overly impacted our results, but, you know, the ordering of the attributes that might have influenced choice, the fact that it was a hypothetical scenario could have influenced choice, or maybe how we presented um, the attributes could have influenced choice. 
though we did try our best to, to not make them in go either way, you know, to influence either way. It was also not possible to create a dominant choice task, which is just a way to create a look at data quality. But um, there's actually some interesting findings um, in terms of our data quality, but I won't get into that today. So in conclusion, all six attributes that we looked at did significantly influence choice. There wasn't one of those attributes that didn't um, mean anything to patients. But in terms of what's most important, activities of daily living or impact of activities of daily living, number of cardiovascular comorbidities, impact on mental health, and number of other comorbidities. And what was least important, BMI and wait time. Um, and just uh, in final conclusion, I'd like to just bring up the definition of obesity, which is actually the abnormal or excessive body fat that impairs health. And these studies really just support that because patient preferences are in line with the fact that it's not just about BMI, it's about the whole clinical picture. And moving forward, I really hope that this helps support an equitable prioritization strategy for our patients uh, and getting the, the patients in most need onto that, into that OR quicker. And finally, I just want to acknowledge our study team, led by Dr. Lori Twells, right here next to me. And I specifically want to highlight our patient partner, because this was a patient-oriented research study, um, Jennifer Dion. She was incredible. Her enthusiasm um, was just amazing. And of course, our support through the NL support unit. Thank you. Excellent job but I would be biased. Uh, we've got uh, about three minutes for questions, if anybody would like to step up. Hi, uh, I'm Marie. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Bariatric Surgery Program in Newfoundland, so this is obviously very interesting for me. Um, I just wonder, this is something that we've kind of been struggling with for a while, is how to manage a big wait list of significantly different patients. So patients with BMIs of you know 40 who are very healthy patients and then patients who are very sick patients with higher BMIs, higher age and more comorbidities. The, the struggle that I've had, we try to use the EOS and all that, but the struggle that we have now is that our surgeons, do, even though we wanna get the sickest patients in first, they don't wanna have an OR day with four very sick patients. So they want us to put in a good mix into the OR. So a couple healthier patients, a couple sicker patients. And the other struggle is if we get all these sicker patients in first, we end up with a huge backlog of people who would really benefit from surgery, but probably um, you know, shouldn't be done first because they're healthy, essentially. Right. So I wonder how we can fix that when we have a set day for ORs for such a mix of patients without ending up with a backlog of patients who deserve surgery and need surgery, but not necessarily in that, that order. Interesting point. I mean, this was definitely a patient-oriented research. We focused on what are patients' perspectives. There's definitely other perspectives that we need to bring to the table. Now, one of our surgeons, of course, were on our team, but we weren't interviewing surgeons. And though that's a very, you know, relevant issue that they've identified. You know, maybe it's too hard to have complex patients. But um, so, yeah, definitely an important issue that hopefully we can work through to create a good balance. Um, in terms of... Um, you know, the extended wait list then for the people who are healthier. Uh, I think that's another important point. And if we talked about this, if we do create a prioritization tool, it's not that wait time is not part of that equation. <laughs> it's just that it would be less important than if someone is, you know, a very high risk of a heart attack or something, or just couldn't get about their daily activities. So it's not that wait time, like the longer patient waits, I think that the more important that would become in terms of moving them ahead. Um, in, term, in terms of creating a quantified tool to, to score patients, for example. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a relevant uh, concern as well, for sure. Yeah. More questions? Oh. Hi. Great, great presentation. Uh, Gord Zeller, University of Saskatchewan. I just finished teaching a res research methods class, and I didn't talk about this street course <laughs> design. So quick question <laughs> on that. Um, is the scenarios you – how many scenarios do you present – and is it based on the number of subjects in the study? Like, where does the validity, uh, you know, come in or get in terms of? So this is, um, when we create these scenarios, each survey that would go out uh, would have 12 choice tasks. But it's the same scenario. We're basically saying two hypothetical patients based described on those characteristics or attributes we identified as important. And which one would you pick first? So it's the same scenario that keeps repeating. And our goal is to help was to identify like how important are these attributes. So 
you can then apply that to a real patient. So if you have a real patient that has a BMI of 50, then we have a weight as to, you know, a, a quantified weight as to how important that is in terms of decision making. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's like, it's, it's the same scenario, it's just a different mix of levels in each choice task that's presented. Yeah. I'll be really yes. quick, Lori, I promise. Um, great presentation. Uh, open disclosure, I'm an occupational therapist, so my question is very biased towards, uh, towards that. So you identified activities of daily living and mental health implications as rated fairly high in terms of that choice. Has there been conversations about then including occupational therapy assessments and interventions pre and post bariatric surgery to help maybe decrease the sort of demand on those services for, for bariatric surgery? Um, interesting. I mean, that that's funny. That didn't come up. We talked a lot about mental health in this pre-qualitative piece, and you know, I think they identified, oh, we need you know mental health supports. But I don't know, maybe if they're not as aware of occupational therapy supports, and that's why it didn't come forward. Um, so it's a really important issue. It's not just the psychological supports they need, but this is probably quite relevant. So it wasn't talked about, but definitely an excellent point. Thank you, everybody. Um, so our second speaker is Dr. Sonia Wicklam from the University of Calgary. And Sonia is going to be talking to us about the implementation of the primary care pathway for the prevention and management of obesity within Calgary Foothills, Foothills <laughs> Primary Care Network. Now, Sonia, do you want to present from there? Because pre Sonia has a broken leg, foot, <laughs> something? Foot, okay, foot. Ankle, okay, soccer. so you're gonna stand, you're gonna sit there and do that, that's perfect. I think so. Can you pass me the sticker? Yes. So is this working? It is working. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, let me get this work. I need to show you the slide here. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I want to uh, thank the Obesity Canada for allowing me to come and present on this topic. Thank you for coming on Friday afternoon. Um, so as uh, Lori mentioned, I am from Calgary. I'm a family doctor and I work in the northwest of Calgary. So we have a the Calgary Foothills Primary Care Network has 400 doctors in it and serves about 400,000 patients. So this project is a partnership with them and with the Calgary Adult Bariatric Surgery Clinic. We have a wonderful team. I also want to acknowledge some collaborators from Edmonton who are sitting right here um, that have been very helpful. I have no conflicts of interest and um, our funder is the Alberta Health Services. So we've heard this week the problem with primary care. We know that um, one of the biggest complaints is, in theory, we don't have enough time to address this issue. Um, we also know that weight bias is high amongst us. So there's a problem. And the also uh, the understanding of the disease is kind of limited. Uh, but it is growing, and I'm hopeful. So what we do know is that our patients do want to talk to us about weight. Um, and Based on Denise's work uh, at U of A, we see that a collaborative model is likely the most effective way to do it and extremely important if we're going to do it well. Some other research has shown that a brief intervention, which family doctors have done you know, in smoking work, smoking, smoking cessation work, et cetera, a brief intervention referring somebody on to support services is more helpful than doing nothing and presuming they're referred on to good support services. And then some more recent l work sort of looking at this brief intervention that refers on to quali quality support services versus a family doctor giving sort of traditional advice showed that that's, it's the former is likely better. So where does that get us is in primary care? It's kind of, do we use teams of people who have developed programs who are um, good at what they do, well studied on what they do and can provide more intensive therapy? Or do we get, do we improve our own skill sets? So in that thinking about how best to move forward with the CFPCN, we looked at, we knew our patients needed support. We know that there's a problem with no-shows and with inappropriate referrals. So the Calgary Adult um, Surgical Clinic, they, at the time that we started this work, they were getting about 250 referrals a month. They have 10 full-time equivalents, and about 50% of people were showing up for the orientation and only about one going on to surgery. When we looked at our books at the primary care network, again, we were seeing 
over 50% no-show rates for one-on-one, -on -one, so appointments that are booked for 60 minutes for our staff. And then we were also seeing a lot of people that, that didn't know why they were being referred. So this is the problem we're trying to address. And then we wanted systems in uh, systems that would be more efficient to handle this problem. So we launched this QI project um, January 2017, and the idea was to improve the coordination of bariatric services, create a tool, screening, and assessment for primary care to specialty care. So we had a large multi-D team got together um, to develop the personalized weight assessment and begin pathway development. We agreed upon some fundamental tools and a way to communicate amongst ourselves um, because the other thing that happens in primary care is that sometimes we, when we want to refer to other specialties, we have to jump through a number of hoops, which, which becomes quite burdensome because we're, dizzy, we're dealing with diseases across the spectrum. So we agreed upon this tool and then we also wanted to develop it in a way that if you were a researcher and wanted to start doing some research in the system, you'd be able to do that kind of easily. And then extremely important, we embedded the tool in the electronic medical record. And at the beginning it was MedAccess and Wolf. We launched in four clinics, which had uh, and 25 physicians. Phase two, we expanded to three more clinics. We were allowed to do more follow-up. And phase three, we're just beginning now and we're getting into more of the patient experience, although we've done some of that work. So this is a look at the pathway. So if we start over on your left, Basically, if a physician, if it's an opportunistic uh, appointment, so for example, you're in for follow-up for pneumonia, but they identify an issue, the physicians get trained on an appropriate ask. So this whole thing is grounded in the five A's, and so the first A being the ask. So we're training on the ask, it takes only a moment, because these individuals, of course, have a great relationship with their patients most of the time. They've gotten to know them over years. And then we embedded a traffic light assessment and just a nod to um, Dana, Dana Lee Bagley and Michael Valis for um, they helped us embed this in our pathway. So if it's a full green light, then they move on to the personalized weight assessment. And now we're set up so we can actually email individuals this questionnaire and they can complete it on their own time at home and when they arrive for their one-on-one -on -one visit, um, with the health management nurse or the registered dietitian or CBE of some kind, um, that that work is done. And then very importantly, um, down in the bottom, your bottom right-hand corner, is they provide, they create the tailored next steps and then they provide feedback to the family doctor. And just highlighting that readiness is, is a big part of our assessment all the way along the way because the the early data that showed us that people weren't ready for their next steps. So key, key, key for primary care is embedding this in a system that works for us, which is our electronic medical records. I just want to highlight really quickly the questionnaire. So again, to give kudos to other people, I worked part-time with Bob Dent a long time ago at the Ottawa Civic Bariatric Clinic and him and, and Judy Shaw, we started work on this questionnaire and then we just kind of finished it in Calgary. But the pink areas are areas where primary care falls down. We know a lot about our patients, but we're not, we're missing some of the key data to really do a good weight history. So weight history is one, sedentary time, we don't catch much, eating patterns we're bad at, food security, we don't have much information on. We take family histories on everything except obesity. Under anthropometrics, we're not very consistent at waist circumference. And then there's very, you know, patchy uptake. I work in Alberta, so there's probably better uptake there than across the country with the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. Um, so methods to help you stage and, and classify the risk of individuals. And then to just highlight the one-on-one -on -one visit, I think, Dr. Campbell Shear's work in Edmonton has really solidified the importance of a strength-based root cause approach using tools and create, having a shared decision-making process um, that is really supportive to patients. So the health management nurses are fantastic at this and they're also keepers of knowledge of resources, which is also really complex for patients. They have no idea about the various programs that they can access to support them. And then lastly, they're good communicators to family practice. They're used to doing it in their roles in our primary care networks.
So here's just a screenshot of the EMR of the summary. And to just, you know, the font's pretty small for some of you, but to highlight, it really does give a nice summary and at the very bottom, busy family practice, I can scroll down and see if they're recommending, you know, somebody appears maybe too depressed at this time, you need to address that. They need a sleep study, you need to address it, etc. We get recommendations handed to us. So we evaluated it with um, patient activation measure, patient experience, and physician experience. And why we use the patient activation measure, we had um, some experience with it in the PCN. Um, we like the fact that it's assessing an individual's knowledge, skill, and confidence, which man managing their health. It has its limitations. Specifically, um, they haven't done work just on obesity or it's, or it's smaller, and it's largely US-based, and it does have cost. The way the activation measure lays out, it goes from level one on the side to disengaged and overwhelmed to level four. And what we found, so remember these patients came in, they were given, you know, they, they had the ask, then a traffic light assessment, so thankfully they came in at level three. So the average coming in was 62, a score of 62. And then what we were really happy about is that after just that one-on-one -on -one visit, we were seeing a nice increase in activation, you know, of three points. And what that equates to, that's where it's harder to make clear judgments, um, broad sweeping statements. You could say that with even one point increase, there are some studies that show a cut of hospitalization of two, two percent, cut of hospitalization, um, sorry, decrease in healthcare costs. Um, of two to three percent. Now we don't know for sure that that will apply to the Canadian situation, but this gave us some reason to be optimistic. And then again, at two to three months post the initial personalized weight assessment, we saw PAM scores increase again. And we actually predicted they were gonna drop because we thought people would enjoy that first visit, be motivated, and then things would sort of taper off. So they actually bumped up even further and pushing, people are now just starting to kiss level four of the patient activation. So it's having a nice impact, and I think that's why Alberta Health Services <coughs> had continued to support us. So we are now not sure what's happening, so we wanna look closer at that. Is it the process? Is it tools that are used? Is it the ongoing support and reiteration of, hey, how's it going now that you're doing X that the health management nurse got you going in? We're not sure. So very quickly, patient satisfaction surveys, all very positive, so you know, the, the pathway is addressing their values. It's provided them with the, the tools and the next steps and the services that they are interested in. And then there we had 54 responses here with the physician, smaller dose, but the champagne bottle comes because a nice group are really happy with the ask. And I know it doesn't sound much when I'm in a crowd at the obesity summit, but, but getting, a, getting a group to buy into performing the ask is a great thing. And then where we have some work to do clearly is that there were still some physicians not very confident that this system would work. So limitations is the QI project. You know, there's lots of more intense work that could be done on it. Clearly we're not engaging the least activated patients and we're still not engaging some physicians. But we are improving patient activation and that really is what it's about. QI projects are based on solving problems for patients and we're helping with the pathway um, and finally it has sort of on the side given us these opportunities these reasons to go to clinics and give um, give talks to introduce the pathway but then also to educate them about obesity thank you thank you Sonia any questions Sonia, I've got a question. Um, I'm just curious to know, I'm thinking back to just teaching general epidemiology, um, and we talk about various biases, but it works the same way in terms of it not being a bias, but the little interactions in some ways are like the Hawthorne effect in the, se in the sense that it's just a small, all of a sudden they've got, a, there's attention drawn to them, yeah. but it's a positive attention. And what you said in terms of the small, it's just a small interaction which they seem to like and therefore actually respond to. And in some ways, could it be as simple as that from the perspective of, you know, sort of changing behaviors or getting at around things around weight loss in terms of actually responding to the physician 
when it's a small interaction. Yes, were you asking could that change the PAM score? Yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. It's some, it could just be that somebody just cares. Yeah, which so but it I might mean, that's, not that's have been important. a big visit. It could have just been the doctor's component saying, yeah. hey, are you, do you want to talk about it? Yeah. yeah. And asking the ask appropriately for the first time ever. Yeah. Because many people um, just avoid the ask. Well, or they haven't had an ask. They've had an edict. You must lose mm -hmm. weight, you know, with no advice on how to do it. So. Yeah, we're not we're not sure. So mm -hmm. we've done some groups. Some of uh, Denise's team have come mm -hmm. down to Calgary and supported us to do some groups. But we have small numbers right now. But that's our next step: is to sort of parse out to make it even more efficient if we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Mr. Kamel Hafizi who will be speaking to us about the effect of methylphenidate on resting energy expenditure, thermic effect of food and physical activity energy expenditure in individuals living with obesity, a pilot study. And Mr. Kamel Havizi is from the University of Ottawa from CHEO. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kamal Afizi. I'm a graduate student at the University of Ottawa, and I did my master's at the Healthy Active Living with Obesity uh, Research Group. My supervisors are Dr. Gary Goldfield and Dr. Eric Doucette. They're in the crowd today. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you about my project titled The Effect of Methylphenidate on Energy Expenditure in Youth and Adults with Obesity, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled pilot trial. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about it. So as we all know, obesity is reaching epidemic proportions in Canada. I guess that's why we're all here, right? Obesity currently affects one in seven youth and one in four adults. And it is defined as having a BMI of over 29.9 in adults and being in the 95th percentile for children. Current behavioral interventions have had limited efficacy when dealing with obesity. Specifically, I looked at a systematic review conducted by Franz et al. in 2007. He did a meta-analysis of weight loss clinical trials with a minimum of one year follow-up. So if we take a look at the figure, we have weight loss in, on the y-axis and time in months on the x-axis. So he looked at a multitude of uh, intervention styles. Uh, specifically, we looked at behavioral interventions here, so diet and diet and exercise. And we see that most weight loss is achieved in the first six months. However, after a four-year follow-up, most participants are back to near baseline values, resulting in only a net loss of roughly two to five kilograms. On the other hand, when we look at different forms of intervention, such as pharmacotherapy, we see the most weight loss seen at two and four years respectively, specifically talking about Orlistat and Sibutramine. So it's not the fact that behavioral interventions are not effective at weight loss, but they're ineffective at dealing with weight maintenance. And so we looked at pharmacotherapy interventions in Canada. And currently there are three anti-obesity agents on the market, Orlistat, Liraglutide, and Contrave. And all are shown to be effective but have adverse effects that limit their efficacy, specifically GI side effects, cost, form of administration, and frequent adverse effects. So we, my lab, we propose looking at methylphenidate as a form of pharmacotherapy. So methylphenidate, also commonly referred to as Ritalin, is an ADHD uh, dopamine reuptake inhibitor, and it's commonly used to treat ADHD in children. Methylphenidate is also shown to affect energy intake and energy expenditure, a critical component of both behavioral com uh, interventions. It's also cost effective, uh, insanely tolerable, <laughs> and has been shown to be orally administered. So we looked at a study conducted in 2008 by Lorello et al, who looked at methylphenidate administration on energy expenditure. So we looked specifically at resting energy expenditure and the thermic effect of food. So for those of you who are unaware, resting energy expenditure can be thought of the metabolic cost to maintain bodily functions at rest. Thermic effect of food is the energy used to digest and store energy consumed. So in this study specifically, he administered MPH in healthy adults, and he looked to see an increase in resting energy expenditure and thermic effect of food. What they found was that there was a significant increase in both REE and TEF, specifically a 7% increase that correlates to a 10 plus or minus 13.5 kcal. So if we look at the figure, he has kcal in minute for RE and TEF on the y-axis, and he has time for the different measurements on the x-axis. So this brings us to our study. Lorello et al. only looked at a one-time dosage, and we wanted to see what the sustained effects of MPH administration would do. So we had three objectives in our study. The first objective was to examine the effects of MPH administration on changes in RE and TEF. 
The second objective was to examine the effects of administration on changes in free living physical activity energy expenditure. And our third objective was to examine the relationship between changes in REE, TEF, TAEE, and how those changes correlate with changes in body composition. To do this, we had a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, two-parallel arm study. We administered either placebo or MPH two times daily, one hour before meals, for a period of 60 days. The dosage we used for MPH was 0.5 milligrams per kilograms, and it should be noted that all participants were, went through a titration period at which we tested their most effective dose. Our inclusion criteria were males and females between the ages of 16 to 40 years old with a BMI of 29.9 or higher, and they must have been able to pass the screening visit. Our exclusion criteria included a multitude of factors such as lifestyle risk factors, diagnosed diseases, and certain medications that may interfere with MPH. In total, we had 10 participants, five in the MPH group and five in the placebo group. Our study timeline took place over 60 days. Over the 60 days, we had one screening visit, two repeater measures test days, our baseline and final, two one-week accelerometry periods, a midpoint visit, a lunch box visit, and a titration period. Our first objective was measured on our baseline one and final visit. We did this through the use of indirect calorimetry using the ventilator hood technique. Essentially, participants would come in fasted from the night before, rest for 30 minutes in a supine position, after which we would collect resting energy expenditure data. Following this, the participants were presented with a 600 kcal standardized breakfast that involved a peanut butter and jam sandwich and two cups of orange juice. Then we would measure thermic effect of food every 30 minutes for a period of three hours. This resulted in four measurements of thermic effect of food. Our hypothesis would, was that there would be an increase in relative REE and TEF in the MPH group compared to placebo. Our second objective looked at measuring the two one-week accelerometry periods. We used actical accelerometers in order to measure physical activity behavior and sedentary behavior. Our hypothesis was that the MPH group will exhibit greater free living physical activity energy expenditure when compared to the placebo group. Our third and final objective was measured on our baseline, midpoint, and final visits. We measured body composition data using dual x-ray absorptometry, also known as the DEXA. This is considered the gold standard in body composition measurement. Our hypothesis was that increases in relative REE would be associated with reductions in body comp. For statistical analysis, we used an independent samples t-test in order to determine group differences at baseline. Following this, we used two group by two time repeater measures at NOVAS for objectives one and two, looking at resting energy expenditure, thermic effect of food, and physical activity energy expenditure before and after intervention. Our third objective was a Pearson correlation, which looked at the changes in energy expenditure variables and how they correlate with changes in body composition. Our results showed that there were no significant differences for anthropometrics at baseline between groups. We then calculated change scores to determine the exact change in body composition between groups. If you look closely, we can see that the MPH group has shown larger weight loss and shown more favorable changes in body composition. Specifically, we see that the MPH group lost 2.6 kilograms versus 1.6 kilograms in the placebo. When looking at the composition of that weight loss, we see that the MPH group lost in total 2.23 kilograms of fat mass, which equated to a reduction of 1.08% in body fat. In comparison to the placebo, the placebo gained 0.42% in percent body fat. Following body composition changes, we looked at changes in resting energy expenditure and thermic effect of food. Both MPH groups for REE and relative REE increased in REE, whereas the placebo group decreased, as is to be expected with weight loss. Our findings were in line with our hypothesis, but one thing to be noted is we were not powered enough to achieve significance. That being said, if we look closely at the relative REE, we see that we had a near significant p-value with 0 0.074 and a large effect size of 0.83, as demonstrated by Cohen's D, implying that MPH has a rather potent effect on resting energy expenditure. When looking at TEF, we saw that there was no significant change between groups, but more on that relative REE point. We looked at relative REE from over 60 days, and as you can see on the graph, we have relative REE on the y-axis, and we have our repeater measures test days on the x-axis. What we see is that the MPH group increased and the placebo group decreased while in the presence of body weight change. Specifically, there was a 10% difference between relative REE values at final between the MPH group and the placebo group. This was due to a 6% increase in MPH and a 4% decrease in placebo. When incorporating the fact that there was body weight change, it shows that REE has a, or MPH has a rather potent effect on REE. Moving on, we looked at physical activity, energy expenditure variables, and sedentary behavior. What we found is that there was no significant differences between groups. This is actually a novel finding, as it has previously been taught in, in the literature 
that MTH, Ritalin, reduces physical activity energy expenditure in children with ADHD. This is a new finding in people without ADHD, perhaps indicating that MTH does not reduce physical activity in a non-ADHD population. When looking at pooled correlations, we see that there are rather strong inverse correlations between changes in relative REE and changes in body weight, body fat percentage, and fat mass. Specifically, what we are seeing is that as REE increases, or relative REE increases, we see favorable changes in body composition, a decrease in body weight, a decrease in percent body fat, and a decrease in fat mass. Once again, we were not powered for significance, yet we still find very strong inverse correlations that are close to significance, implying that MPH has a rather potent effect on REE and body composition. When looking at our findings, we see that MPH has a rather potent effect on REE. By administering MPH, it leads to an increase in synaptic dopamine. Dopamine infusion has previously been shown to result in a thermogenic effect. When looked at closely, it was determined that the increase in dopamine resulted in an increase in glucagon secretion. Glucagon has previously been linked to thermogenic energy expenditure. So we believe that the increase in REE is due to an increase in glucagon, which occurs from the increase in synaptic dopamine. Extrapolated over a 24 hour period, our findings show that it is a roughly 200 kcal per day increase in the MPH group. When extrapolated over a period of 17 days, that's equal to one pound of fat. So although we do not achieve statistical significance, these findings are clinically meaningful. Our findings also mirror findings from a pre the previous study, Lorello et al. in 2008. The reason we did not achieve significance can be due to the methodological differences. Specifically, Lorello et al. had a larger sample size. They looked at normal, healthy weight adults, while we looked at individuals with obesity. As well, we did a between subjects effect design, whereas they did a within subjects effect design. In summary, our findings suggest that MPH has a rather potent effect on relative resting energy expenditure, with increases in the MPH group at 6% and a roughly 10% difference at final. Our study also suggests that MPH has no significant effect on thermic effect of food, and that the change in there is a lack there of change in physical activity energy expenditure variables is actually a promising finding. Our findings also suggest that we have very strong inverse correlations between changes in anthropometrics and changes in energy expenditure variables. Although not statistically significant, these can be considered clinically meaningful findings. The significance of the study, so as obesity is a continuously growing concern and current behavioral interventions have had limited efficacy, there is a need for new interventions. The significance of our pilot study is that we showed feasibility for the first time. We also looked at promising trends and we found that relative REE increases in the MPH group. Although not statistically significant, the increase in REE can be considered clinically significant. As well, the lack of change in the physical activity energy expenditure is a novel finding that has not previously been seen over prolonged administration in a non-ADHD population. The changes in body composition were favorable, and we hope that with continued research, we can do this, continue this study with a larger sample size, a longer duration, and test for efficacy. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if this is on. Uh, just can you see any downside? So I've prescribed methylphenidate for a long mm -hmm. time now. Um, anything, if that's the mechanism, can you think of things that we should be watching for or careful with negative effects of bumping that? Mm -hmm. So the, the good thing with MPH is it's a well-tolerated drug and most of the side effects that you can see can be controlled for with dosage. So in our study in particular, from all the participants we tested, not a single one reported any adverse effect as moderate or higher. Uh, we sent them home essentially with red cap and had them report daily for a period of two weeks and then once a week from then on until the end of the study. And over the entire duration of the study, nobody had rated any side effects as moderate or higher. So, so far from what we've seen in the 60 days is there's no significant change in adverse effects, but that's kind of one of the things we're aiming to test is we want to see the longevity of MPH as a form of administration. So this was just one of the first pilot trials and we're hoping that future studies will look at a longer period. Ours was only two months, but hoping the next one will be about six months and then a year after that. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I have one more Camille, we've got another question here. I don't know if this is on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, Alicia Taylor from Memorial University of Newfoundland. Um, I just had a quick question about, I guess, the drug in general. 
um, for the most part, it would be prescribed as an ADHD medication. So is there a lot of research in terms of the safety of prescribing it to individuals without ADHD and then it potentially changing their brain chemistry or is there anything on like withdrawals from being off that medication? Uh, Ms. Barger, then. Okay. Uh, so actually, we uh, we looked at uh, looking at safety protocols in terms okay. of uh, non ADHD population, and so we included a very stringent exclusion criteria to ensure that there was no overlap between what could be a possible adverse effect. So um, I wanted to bring up the slide, but I don't have it there. That's but essentially, it outlines a very stringent exclusion criteria to ensure that we didn't have any uh, overlap between medication side effects and pre existing conditions. Right. Okay. And in terms of withdrawals as well, like, is there anything on um, being on that medication for a longer period of time mm -hmm. and then coming off of it? And so with MPH, uh, specifically the one we used, after administration, it takes about 30 minutes to an hour before an effect is uh, mm -hmm. seen. So there's not really a high associated with the drug. So in terms mm -hmm. of a withdrawal or a dependency, the body mm -hmm. doesn't really build up one for MPH. Okay. So there isn't a, a withdrawal period per se. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Next up, we have Miss Sophia Laforé from Quebec, who will be speaking to us about breast adipose tissue, glucocorticoid, and estrogen levels, and the link with breast cancer prognostic markers and adiposity. So first, I want to thank the OBGD committee to allow me to present some of my uh, PhD data. So without further ado, I'll, I'll start. Um, so from an epidemiological standpoint, obesity is an important modifiable uh, risk factor of breast cancer. In addition, obesity is also associated with a poor prognosis, a poor response to treatments, so chemotherapy, radiotherapy, as well as surgery as well as a lower five-year survival rate, and this for women of all ages. So as such, to better comprehend the complex relationship of obesity and breast cancer, we decided to explore the adipose tissue dysfunction as a potential intermediary contributing factor. So we know from previous studies, including our own, that obesity is characterized by dysfunctional adipose tissue, and the latter is characterized, among others, by low-grade chronic inflammation, insulin resistance, and alter secretion of molecules, such as hormones. So this plethora of biological process can lead to tumor development, growth, and survival. So we decided to investigate the potential contribution of these steroids hormones as the adipose tissue is an important site for the extragonadal uh, steroid hormone biosynthesis. So one of the most expressed and one of my favorite steroid converting enzyme <laughs> in the adipose tissue is 11-beta-HSD type 1. So among others, 11-beta-HSD type 1 can convert, as you can see there, oh, I can prepare. As you can see there, the 11-beta-HSD type 1, sorry, can convert the inactive cortisone into active cortisol. Uh, of note, 11-beta-HSD type 1 is not only overexpressed in hypertrophied adipocytes, but its reductive activity is also increased. So the adipose tissue also express several enzymes which lead to the biosynthesis of the estrogens from their precursor steroids, uh, the androgens. So for example, the main enzyme is aromatase, which is the rate limiting enzyme for the synthesis of the estrogens there from the precursor steroids. However, it's not the only enzyme that is important there. We have also the 17 beta HSD type 7 and 12, or also known as the estrogenic 17 beta HSD. So our previous work showed that aromatase transcript, but not those uh, estrogenic uh, 17 beta expression in the breast adipose tissue was increased as a function of adiposity in a sample of women with breast cancer. However, the contribution of both the the androgens, sorry, and the glucocorticoids for the progression uh, of breast cancer is still unknown. And why is that? 
uh, is because the literature is very scarce with uh, adipose tissue estrogen zeta, as well as with other steroids um, concentration within tissue due to the methodological issue relative to their measurements. So here I'm showing you two statements from the endocrine society highlighting why we do have this gap in the literature. So since 2015, the Endocrine Society requests the use of MS-based uh, generated data uh, for the measurement of the steroid assay. However, even with those precise methods, so the GC or the LC-MSMS, the estrogen quantification remains a challenge due to the, the interesting characteristic of the estrogen, so their poor ionization profile, uh, as well as their low amount in some tissue, such as uh, the adipose tissue. So the purpose of this study was to quantify the estrogens, uh, the two mines, so estradiol and estrone, and the glucocorticoids, cortisone and cortisol, in the breast adipose tissue and to assess their relationship with both adiposity and breast cancer pronostic markers in both healthy women and uh, women suffering from breast cancer. So we hypothesized that both of, the, of those class of, of sex steroids would be uh, implicated uh, with adiposity as well as uh, with breast cancer uh, pronostic markers. So uh, in order to test this hypothesis, we obtain fresh adipose tissue from uh, healthy women as well as women undergoing um, surgery for their breast cancer treatment. Uh, we develop in collaboration with the University of Edinburgh an extraction and a really sensitive uh, LC MSMS method to be able to accurately quantify them. And then we collected the clinical pathological data from the medical records as well as from in person interviews. So, here I present to you a really small summary of my table one. So, <laughs> for all of my women, we had 23. Uh, mean age was 55. Uh, women were generally overweight with a median BMI of 26. One third of the women were promenopausal, and there was no uh, difference uh, between the control uh, and uh, the, the patient. So for the case, most women presented with a tumor which was ER and PR positive, so it was both of them at the same time. Um, and for the TNM status, most women had stage one or stage two breast cancer. So maybe to this audience, it doesn't mean uh, a lot of things, but uh, it's relatively well treatable cancer. So they're all alive still. <laughs> Uh, so women with uh, ER and PR breast tumors had higher, uh, high, higher levels of both estrogen in their breast adipose tissue. So this was not surprising, as you can see here, it's estradiol for the ER uh, PR negative and ER the ER PR positive. And we see the same uh, for estrone. And as with previous work, we know that estrone, since it's a precursor, you have more levels of it than estradiol. And you can also see uh, two representative chromatography peaks from uh, estradiol and estrone in the tissue. Uh, you can also see on this slide that there seems to be like a really different, uh, like a bimodal distribution in the ER and PR positive. So some women are really below the median and uh, some are higher, but we looked at patient difference between those two groups and we did not see anything different in terms of tumor characteristic, menopausal status, uh, BMI, etc. Um, like I told you, we also look at other breast cancer pronostic markers such as tumor size, which is quite important and it was negatively associated with the estradiol level in the breast adipose tissue. Uh, we did not see the same relationship with estrone, and this was true even after adjustment uh, for common uh, covariates in the breast cancer world, so menopausal status and current hormonal derivative intake. Uh, surprisingly, and contrary to our expectations, uh, we saw that women with a higher BMI had lower estradiol levels in the breast ad adipose tissue for the women with cancer. Uh, we did not see this relationship in the whole cohort, but we did see a decreased estradiol to estrone ratio uh, in all the cohort. Uh, it was the same kind of relationship, really. And when we adjust for anything, then the, the relationship disappears. So it's unclear if it's uh, an effect, just an effect of BMI or age or uh, hormonal intake. 
Uh, we also look, as I previously stated, at the glucocorticoid levels and the breast uh, cancer pronostic markers. So as with estradiol, cortisol was negatively associated uh, with tumor size, and this was true even if we had BMI into our model. We saw the same relationship to really more pronounced with cortisone. Still was true after adding BMI in the model. And this is not really surprising um, because we know that uh, some have proposed that cortisone is really a better marker of the activation of the 11 beta HSD uh, type 1 enzyme, which I told you I like very much. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 like I told you, uh, endogenous levels of cortisone and not cortisol uh, may better represent the activation or the activity of that enzyme, since we know that there is an increased turnover of cortisol in several conditions, such as obesity. Uh, further, we uh, did not find a relationship between cortisol and cortisone uh, taken separately, but together as a ratio, we found an interesting relationship with the TNM staging. So, and that was mainly driven by the women that had a, a DCIS tumor, so the stage zero. And I did not put uh, the control women on that slide, so they will be like minus one or, you know, not a really number, uh, but their um, ratio would be even greater because for s four of the six of those women, even if we had a relatively low uh, limit of quantification, we could not detect any cortisone in the breast adipose tissue. And furthermore, this relationship was still true even if after adjusting for uh, BMI. So in summary, um, we found only one relationship with adiposity and it was with estrogens and contrary to our expectation, it was a negative relationship uh, for uh, the uh, women presenting with hormone uh, positive tumors, we had uh, only a relationship but with both estrogens, which we were hoping for. Uh, both the estrogens and the glucocorticoids were negatively uh, associated with tumor size, and only the ratio of, the, of both glucocorticoids were associated uh, with um, a greater uh, TNM staging. So for the conclusion and the further perspective, we were able to really be quantify uh, both the estrogens and the glucocorticoid in the breast adipose tissue from both healthy women and women suffering from breast, for, from breast cancer. So uh, this is the first time in our knowledge that uh, we were someone was able to do that. And those findings allow further exploration of both their roles in the etiology of breast cancer. However, we were unable to find a relationship between glucocorticoid and adiposity markers, contrary to our expectation, as 11 beta HSD type 1 is increased in adiposity. Uh, 11 beta HSD type 1 also converts 11 ketoandrogens to their inactive 11 OH counterparts, which could be an important mechanism that has not been yet studied in the breast cancer world. However, lower concentration of both the glucocorticoid were seen, and that maybe could be explained by their anti-inflammatory properties, and this could represent more of a breast cancer-related effect than the adiposity per se. And finally, my estrogens. So <laughs> despite the uh, large body of evidence that there is a higher, higher aromatase expression with increased adiposity, we found lower estradiol in, um, with obesity in our cohort. Um, so uh, furthermore, we also show that estradiol were negatively associated with tumor size, and we were unable to find a relationship with the TNM stage or the tumor grade and the estradiol. So those results point out to an increased rate conversion rate in women with an ER and PR positive tumor, and an overall increase in estrogenic steroid production from adipose tissue by volume in obesity and not to an increase by unit of mass per se. So uh, to finish this presentation, I would like to acknowledge uh, my PhD supervisor labs, André Tchernoff, uh, as well as my co-director, Caroline Zerio, and the Root and, the Root and Drew Laboratory in Edinburgh to help me develop this uh, mass spec-based method, as well as all the collaborators, the CNDO for funding, my PhD scholarship, and my PhD travel scholarship to Scotland and to air to obesity Canada. So thank you. Do we have any questions? 
doesn't seem very complicated to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my area. Um, just one question, which might seem really silly, but not knowing this at all, but just your last couple of comments there. What I've just been hearing recently when I just listen to news items about breast cancer um, and listen to podcasts, actually, <laughs> but it's they're, they're starting to put together breast, the density of the breast tissue with breast cancer. Is yes. Yeah, as a high risk. Yeah. So, so does that have anything to do with what you're doing as well? Because I noticed just the last <laughs> couple of statements there were around density and the... Um yeah. So uh, my co-director is actually a specialist of uh, the density. So she published several papers, so I can answer that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the density is really important, but it's more related to the epithelial cells than the adipose tissue per se. So it's uh, like the percentage of the epithelial cells. So it's like a mathematic function. More you have the epithelial cell, more they have the potential capacity to transform and then become cancer cells. So that is the relation with density. There is no uh, known link with uh, the increase of uh, the breast size and uh, breast cancer. There's some study that has been done to look at that relationship. Doesn't seem that important. It's more like the, the epithelial part. But the uh, deposit in general seems important, especially the central obesity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, number five, <laughs> we have uh, Miss Christine Godzik uh, from the University of Alberta, who will be talking about sarcopenic obesity in adults with knee osteoarthritis. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, excited to present a little bit of a part of my PhD research for you. Um, my research has focused on adults who have knee osteoarthritis. And we know there's a link between knee osteoarthritis and obesity. Um, and I really wanted to focus on patients that have um, more, that, uh, we know this disease is chronic and progressive, so I wanted to focus on patients that have end-stage disease. So these are patients that it's progressed, there's uh, joint damage, significant pain, and an impaired function in this population. And we know the best treatment for a lot of these patients at some point, if they get to this end stage, it might be a surgical joint replacement or a knee arthroplasty. Now, right now, um, in Canada, what happens is usually they get referred by their primary care provider to an orthopedic clinic, um, and there they're considered if they're suitable for this joint replacement. Um, there is some evidence that in patients who have a BMI above 30 that there's increased surgical infection risk. It's all based on BMI, um, and there's also some controversy about that, about that literature um, because they've just dichotomized BMI into above and below 30. They haven't looked at other comorbidities, um, and there's some small sample sizes that have been used to develop that. So, and this also led us to question, I mean, we know BMI is not the greatest measure, and yet to be able to, what happens for some patients is if they have a BMI like in their 30s or 40s, they're often told by the surgeons that they're ineligible for surgery unless they lose weight and drop their BMI. So this leaves these patients kind of at this end stage of, of not being able to have surgery unless they lose weight. Um, and again, this question made us question, well, is BMI the best indicator? And is there something else that could be going on with these patients? And primarily we were looking at, how about sarcopenic obesity, when we start to look at that body composition piece. Now, sarcopenic obesity is defined as a presence of low muscle mass with higher fat mass. So it is a, it is a body composition thing that we're looking at. Um, and with when we talk about low muscle mass, it's really the decline in muscle mass. Um, and that's, what we're, that's the, what's most important. And we know that for all of us, as we get older, our muscle mass does decline. Uh, it starts around in their 40s and a uh, steeper decline after age 50. Um, this muscle decline can also be accelerated by adiposity-related inflammation. So in these patients that have obesity, there's a higher risk of this. Uh, cr certain chronic diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, can actually accelerate that muscle loss as well. And then we know with weight loss, we often lose a portion of lean mass alongside of loss of fat mass. And then when weight is regained, which we know is quite common, uh, it's usually just adipose tissue that is regained. We don't usually regain lean mass. So this weight cycling or this weight loss, weight regain can predispose um, patients to this muscle loss. And then inactivity as well. If we're not able to move, we're gonna lose some muscle mass. So if you think about all these criteria, this is occurring in a lot of patients that have knee osteoarthritis and obesity. Now importantly, we can't identify sarcopenic obesity using BMI. 
So here's an example. I have three patients with the exact same BMI. They have significant differences in their body composition of fat mass and lean mass. And it's actually this patient on the far left that has clinically important low muscle mass that is almost hidden or masked by their higher adiposity. We don't think about sarcopenia occurring in patients with higher body size, but it does occur. We know that this phenotype is associated with increased mortality risk, increased surgical risk, longer recovery times, longer hospital stays, and poor physical function. In, a lot of, in, a, in several clinical populations, this has been examined, even though this is sort of a newer phenotype we're identifying. But there's very little research on this in patients with osteoarthritis. So that led to our study, and we really were just curious going, well, what is the prevalence of this phenotype in patients who have end-stage knee osteoarthritis and obesity, and what are the implications of this condition? So for our study, it was a cross-sectional study. We were at an uh, orthopedic clinic that's a centralized referral site from patients from their primary care physicians. So they are referred. Um, they either have um, unilateral or bilateral knee osteoarthritis, um, and they all had a BMI above 30. So we did select so that all patients would have be identified as having uh, ob obesity classified by BMI. Our main outcomes we were interested in was physical function and strength. So we wanted to know what gait speed over four meters was, the six minute walk test, um, and then maximal hand grip strength in the dominant hand. And then we looked at some patient reported outcomes as well. So we looked at quality of life using the EQ5D and some osteoarthritis specific pain and function measures using the WOMAC. And all patients had their body composition measured with DEXA. Now, DEX is, uh, is considered the reference standard for identification of sarcopenia or sarcopenic obesity, um, and it's clinically available, so it was it defined why we wanted to use it. It is, does have limitations, but it allows us to quantify uh, muscle uh, components of lean mass, fat mass, and bone mass. Now, when we think about sarcopenic obesity, what we're really interested in actually is the muscle mass. And to look at that, we want to define it by appendicular skeletal muscle mass. So we look at the lean mass of the arms plus legs. And because we know that someone who's five feet tall versus someone who's six feet tall, they're going to have differences in that muscle mass. Um, so it's usually adjusted by a measure of body size. Now, in the sarcopenia literature, it's often adjusted by height, uh, height squared. And, um, but that's been tested more in older adults, and they have normal body size. What we know in patients with higher body size, that's not, it doesn't identify patients very well that have, a, have an, um, a, an imbalance in their ratio between lean mass and fat mass that's actually impairing their health. So we know that ASM adjusted by weight or by BMI are preferential in these populations. And what we found actually is that ASM by BMI is the best. So I hate, I know I don't, we always like to trash BMI, but in this case, it actually it has, has some value because BMI accounts for both height and weight in that measure. So it is a good measure to adjust the muscle mass by. And there are published cut points for low ASM by BMI that are used to identify this clinically important low muscle mass. Okay, so here's our sample. We measured body composition in 151 patients. Um, we had a pretty good mix between males and females, a few more females, um, and we had an age range between 40 and 88 years. Um, we had primarily a Caucasian sample, um, and then BMI ranged from 30 up to 56.7. So I just want to point out something here. This is just looking at some variability in body composition across BMI categories. So what we have here, on the, the graph on the left is fat mass on the y-axis and BMI on the x-axis. The graph on the right is muscle mass on the y-axis by BMI on the x-axis. And if you look, I've also shaded different classes of BMI, uh, the World Health Organization you know, classifications of obesity uh, by different BMI categories. So you have class one, class two, class three. And so what you see from this first graph is you go, we can look at the relationship between fat mass and BMI is different than the relationship between muscle mass and BMI. And what we start to see in muscle mass is you can see distinctions between males and females. Um, and what I also want to point out is that there's wide variability in each body composition category. So we might say, oh, someone a BMI of 30 to 35, oh, they pretty much must have the same body composition. But when we look, we can see that there's, almost, there's large differences in the amount of fat mass in individuals who have the same BMI 
or BMI category even, and here are same big, large differences in the amount of muscle mass between two patients in that same BMI category. And if we quantify this, we see that there's more than a 20 kilogram difference between two patients. Again, they may both have this uh, BMI in 30 to 35 category, but there's 20 kilogram differences. And here it's most important in when we think about muscle mass. That's a significant difference. So in this graph, what I've actually done is identified those patients who are below that cut point for low ASM by BMI. So we're identifying them as having low muscle mass. And you can see the ones that are identified as having sarcopenic obesity or this low muscle mass are identified in red. So we have females on the left, males on the right. And again, what I want you to see here is that there's, this occurs across BMI categories. So you can't say that this is only happening in uh, patients with BMIs above 40. It's happening across these BMI categories. And I don't have the data here, but it occurs across age categories as well. So that we divided by uh, into uh, age 40 to 64.9 and 65 plus, and we found equal ratios um, uh, in both those age categories. So this isn't something that just occurs in older adults. It does occur in middle age as well. And what I really want you to look at here, and I'm going to circle them, is these patients that sit on the really low end, they have low muscle mass. And so if, you were, if this patient's told to lose weight because they need to have knee arthroplasty surgery and they lose 20 pounds, a portion of that muscle loss is going to be lean mass. Well, they already have clinically important low muscle mass. And we know that regaining of muscle mass is quite difficult, especially as we get older. So I challenge you to say, well, maybe we shouldn't be advising weight loss in these patients. We could actually be putting them at significant risk. Oh, see, I also wanted to look at what's the prevalence. So how many of our patients have this? Now, in our total sample, almost, well, more than a quarter of them were identified with having low muscle mass. But there are differences between sexes that we identified with a higher prevalence in males. Now, this wasn't too surprising. We know that um, with endocrine changes as we get older, so for females, menopause or andropause in males, this, there's a steeper decline in muscle mass loss in males. So this wasn't too surprising for us to see, but it is important to note that the males might be more susceptible to this. So then we looked at our outcomes. We really wanted to look at that physical function and strength. And what we found is that gait speed was significantly slower in this group. If we took the, all those in red and put them in one group and all the ones that have normal muscle mass in the other group, that group with sarcopenic obesity or low muscle mass has slower gait speed. They also have uh, less distance that they can walk in six minutes. And they have lower grip strength than that other, that other subgroup. So again, these are all patients that already have knee osteoarthritis. Their gait is already impaired from that. And now we add this, so we can actually see a distinction between these groups. Now what I want to point out here is this is just the, the hard kind of data presented, but I wanted to show that, that those differences in gait speed and six-minute walk tests were not only statistically significant, but they're clinically relevant and clinically significant because we know a gait speed of, of uh, difference of 0 0.1 meters per second is significant for patients um, in terms of uh, mobility limitations, and a six-minute walk speed less than 50 meters is, again, s a significant indication. The other thing I want to show here is that we didn't find differences in the patient reported quality of life or Womack scores except on the EQ5D under the self-care dimension. So this is where patients identify that they have problems uh, washing or dressing themselves. So this was really interesting to us that we had a, a significant a uh, larger proportion of patients with sarcopenic obesity identify that they have problems with these self-care activities. Now, we didn't look specifically at activities of daily living, but this highlights that this is a group that has impairment in their daily activities, right? They can't, they're having troubles washing, dressing themselves. They're having troubles with uh, gait. So what we're seeing is this is a population that has mobility impairments and quality of life um, impairments that should be identified. So kind of a summary of all that, just to give you an overview. So we think about one in three males um, in this population with end-stage knee osteoarthritis has, the, has this low muscle mass, and about one in five females. And it just again to reinforce that we can't identify this using BMI at all. At all. So we need to start talking about body composition and its importance in this population. And we can see that this actually has uh, important implications on function. And I just want to throw it out to you is that, you know, a lot of times they decide if a patient should have a knee replacement surgery based on their impaired function. Well, what if their impaired function is due to their low muscle mass, not actually the knee arthritis itself? Maybe they might have poorer outcomes after that surgery that they, they'll think the surgery was not effective, but maybe if we identified this beforehand and managed it, maybe they would have better outcomes. So we didn't examine that in this study, though. 
Um, and so this is something that we think is really important in osteoarthritis. Uh, just there are limitations obviously this is a cross-sectional study so we didn't look at what caused the development of sarcopenic obesity um, we didn't uh, we know it's a primary Caucasian sample so it may not transfer to other ethnic groups and we didn't control for other treatments so certainly some patients could have um, better function because maybe they were having cortisone shots or other treatments so that is something that we identify as a limitation um, but this work is very novel um, last year we published a scoping review looking at what evidence there was on sarcopenic obesity in adults with obesity and knee osteoarthritis, and we found very few. So this is work that needs to be done, and we need to have start having these conversations. So kind of conclusions is that, again, I hate to throw, I don't want to throw BMI out because I see it has some value in here. It does provide a good measure that we can, you know, use in addition to body composition, but I have to put that piece there that we need to start looking at body composition in our patients especially before we start recommending weight loss for some patients. If they have low muscle mass, we could actually predispose them to uh, significant impairment. Um, and we need to increase our awareness and screening for this condition. And really most important, again, we know that if, we, if patients lose more muscle mass, they already potentially could have low muscle mass. So we need to focus on preserving muscle mass, strength, and function and start talking about you know, resistance training and other activities that we could do. That is considered the best treatment right now for sarcopenic obesity, I and sarcopenia is resistance exercise. So if we can do that from a pre preventative approach, that might be better. And just to acknowledge um, uh, my, co my supervisor and my, uh, the funding we've received for this and the travel award from Obesity Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Uh, do we have any questions? Yep, over here. That was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, any indication on the sex hormones in those patients? Uh, were there any with low androgens? And would this be a consideration for management of the low muscle mass? And also, was there an effect of age in your, uh, in, in your subgroups with the low muscle mass? Perfect. We actually didn't look at any, I should have put that as a limitation, we didn't look at any biochemical markers at all. So for sure that might be something that needs to be investigated is, is, the, is the hormones. Um, and then again, age, is your sec second part was about age, correct? Yeah, no, they were, we found uh, no difference in age between those with low muscle mass or sarcopenic obesity and without. So again, we're seeing that it's not happening in an only the older group, it's happening even in like an age 40 to 50. So thank you. better move on. Thank you very much. Uh, right, our last speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Corita Vincent from the University of Toronto, and she will be talking about the effect of age and EOS, obesity stage on weight loss. Uh, so my name is Corey Vincent. I'm a resident at, in internal medicine at U of T, and I'm going to be presenting some data that I did in conjunction with the Wharton Medical Clinic and uh, uh, Dr. Hook from York. Uh, so just very briefly, we all know that the prevalence of obesity in Canada has been increasing since about the 1980s. Um, and then alongside that, we have an increasing proportion of the Canadian population that's over the age of 65. And this is actually quite a significant uh, change in our population. And within the next 15 years, it's estimated that even up to a quarter of our population could be over the age of 65. And what we also know is that obesity increases with age. And up to 33% of those between the ages of 60 and 79 have obesity. And so really what we're going to be seeing in the next 10, 15 years is that there are going to be a lot more people who are in this older age population who have obesity. And it's become increasingly important to know what the complexities of treating this, uh, this disease in these people are. And so the biggest complexity that always comes up when we talk about obesity in older adults is the obesity paradox. So this is the idea that in older adults, there might be some benefit to having a bit of extra weight on board in case they have an acute illness and have to go to the hospital. And so some of the early studies showed that elevated BMI in el adults over the age of 65 actually was associated with a reduction in mortality. And this sort of scared people into uh, recommending weight loss in this population. But further studies and meta-analyses showed that actually it's that overweight population that has the most protection, and there is actually an increase, a slight increase in mortality for people who are in the obese categories. And then, again, early studies showed that weight loss in middle to older adults was associated with increased mortality and a reduction in, in, in functioning overall. And so, again, we were so afraid to recommend weight loss in this population, but 
those early studies didn't look at intentional weight loss and they didn't look at the starting weight of the population. So uh, when later studies then looked at intentional weight loss, they saw actually, oh, there's a mortality benefit associated with weight loss in this population. And some studies showed no effect, but not the same negative effect that we were seeing initially. So now looking at weight loss in older adults, we see that some studies have shown that with increasing age, older adults actually have better success with weight loss. Um, other studies have not seen the same effect, but it seems like there must be something about older adults that makes them more able to lose weight. Thinking about other things that can affect weight loss, um, some studies have looked at obesity severity. So seeing that having a higher obesity severity at the start of a weight loss program actually makes it more difficult to lose the weight. A lot of these studies use BMI as the sole predictor of obesity severity, um, which has problems we've kind of already talked about. Um, but there was one study that used the Edmonton Obesity Staging System, which is a more holistic way of looking at obesity severity, and found that, uh, again, lower, uh, so the people who had the lowest obesity severity lost the most weight, so easier to lose weight when you don't have quite as much severity on board. I'll just take a brief sidebar to explain the Edmonton Obesity Staging System because it's gonna become more important as we go on. So I mentioned before there's problems with um, just using BMI because it ignores the medical, mental, and functional problems that come along with obesity and it doesn't address any of those complications. And so the Edmonton Obesity Staging System looks at a stage from zero to four where zero is an elevated BMI but no complications, either medical, mental, or functional and then all the way over to stage four, which would be end stage disease. And so that brings me to the purpose of this study, which is to examine the independent and joint effects of age and obesity severity on weight loss. And the reason that the obesity severity and age kind of go together is because a lot of those complications that we see with increasing obesity severity, like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, also increase with age. And so people who are older and have obesity tend to have higher EOS scores. But we also know that when you have higher obesity severity, it makes it harder to lose weight, and yet older adults have an easier time losing weight. So we decided to look at this in a population of participants uh, already undergoing a weight loss program. So we did this through the Wharton Medical Clinic, which is a publicly funded referral-based multidisciplinary weight management clinic. Uh, and importantly, all of the patients in this clinic sign an informed consent at the beginning of entry to the program, which allows us to use their data in presentations like this. So we include people who were over the age of 18, who had BMIs over 25, and were participating in behavioral weight management. So we excluded people who were having bariatric surgery or using weight loss medications. We also excluded anybody who had a treatment duration of less than three months, uh, and if they had significant missing data, such as age, uh, missing weight or waist hip circumference. And so when we looked at age, we uh, split it up into generations. Um, so we looked at millennials being individuals from 18 to 35, generation X would be 35 to 50, baby boomers 50 to 70, and gener uh, sorry, the silent generation is those over 70. We already talked about disease severity, so we used EOS for this. And we categorized patients as EOS zero to three. We were not able to use EOS four because it's not compatible with the study data that we had. Um, and really the patients who were attending the clinic really didn't fit into this, um, this stage either. And this is just an example of how we would have uh, operationalized the EOS. And so we based this on previously published uh, studies which have done the same thing uh, and actually one study which used the same data set. Um, so it's just an example with hypertension. So for our analysis, we used one-way ANOVA to assess group differences on baseline parameters, and then multivariable linear regression to assess the association between age and EOS, uh, on, with weight loss, uh, sorry, age and EOS on weight loss, with adjustments for BMI, sex, time, uh, treatment time, and some of medical conditions. And then we moved on to do a similar analysis using log binary regression to look at uh, whether there is a difference in terms of a significant weight loss, so using weight loss greater than 5% as a cutoff. So in terms of population characteristics, so this, this is uh, separated by generation, uh, and we see that we appropriately separated out generations with different ages. There was significantly fewer patients in the over 70 category. Um, overall, most of the participants were female, but there were slightly more men in the oldest uh, subgroup. 
And then BMI actually was highest in the millennials, so that youngest population had the highest BMI. And then I've just included two medical conditions. We measured a lot, but just to give you a sense that they varied across the different generations. So cardiovascular disease, for example, as it, we would predict, increased with increasing age. But for mental health disorders, we saw that they were highest amongst the millennials and actually decreased with increasing age. And I think that might be partially related to um, like bias in terms of reporting, but I think it's also interesting to note. And then when we looked at EOS, again, not surprisingly, we saw that there was higher prevalence of uh, higher obesity severity with increasing age. So for EOS 0 and 1, they decreased in prevalence with increasing age, and EOS 2 and 3 increased with increasing, prev uh, increased with increasing age. And then across all of the generations, EOS 2 is the most uh, common. So in terms of results, this is the linear regression. So in terms of main effects, we saw that there was an association between age and weight loss, which has been shown in other studies previously. We did not see any association in terms of a main effect with weight loss in EOS stage. In terms of the interaction effect, so this, uh, this here is the binary regression analysis, and so it's the relative risk for a 5% weight loss. And our comparison group, we used the healthiest individuals, so the millennials with an EOS of zero. So when we look at this, we see that uh, EOS score significantly modified the association between age and weight loss. And I think what's particularly noticeable is for the silent generation, so those are the adults over 70, we see that the healthiest older adults had the highest um, likelihood to lose over 5% of their weight in comparison to, again, that healthiest millennial EOS zero population. But then the risk ratio starts to go down when you increase the EOS stage. And this is different for the different, gener the different generations. So when we look at the generation X and the baby boomers, it almost follows more of a U-shaped pattern. So we see that the EOS 1 and EOS 2 are the more likely to lose uh, a significant amount of weight when they're compared to the, EO, uh, the EOS 0 millennials. And then for the millennials, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect at all for the EOS. So this might be why we didn't see a significant main effect for EOS is because there's so much different things going on based on the different generations. And so it really leads us to why this is happening. And for the um, when we go back to the silent generation, so these are the older adults above the age of 70, previously studies have hypothesized that this group is most likely to lose weight because they have more time to dedicate to behavioral weight management programs. And conceptually, this would actually make sense if we're looking at EOS as decreasing their likelihood to lose weight. So those people who have more obesity complications, who are spending more of their time like, taking care of medications and all of these things, would have less time to dedicate to weight loss. Another thing that we weren't unfortunately able to look at is was function, function. So we didn't have data on activities of daily living, but with increasing EOS, we could potentially see that these people have lower functioning and then would be less able to participate in weight management programs. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention about reasons behind this is the getting back to that point I made about the differences in the prevalence of medical conditions in the different generations. So maybe there's a difference in the way that people are being categorized. So in the millennials, maybe an EOS of two is more commonly related to depression, whereas in the silent generation, it's more likely to be related to cardiovascular disease. And maybe there's some inherent difference to that and how it affects their weight loss. So there are obviously strengths and limitations to this study. I think a benefit is that it's a large a data set. It's a real world situation. And so it helps with our generalizability. And we were really the first people to examine this interaction effect between obesity severity and age. Uh, in terms of limitations, there, it was a single type of weight loss program. So the generalizability, while it's great that it was real world, it might be limited because of uh, being all from one type of program. And then we didn't have any data on disease duration, which could affect the ability of participants to lose weight. And again, as I mentioned, no information on activities of daily living. So just in terms of take home messages, so we saw that older age was associated with increased weight loss, which has been shown in previous studies. And, but we added to this by showing that there was a significant interaction between obesity severity, specifically using the EOS and age on weight loss and that older adults who are healthier have the highest likelihood of achieving a clinically significant weight. 
And in terms of future directions, I think there's a lot to be explored, but the most uh, exciting for me is just how to best support these individuals. So how can we target older adults who have higher disease severity because these are the people who are suffering the most from the complications and negative consequences of obesity. That's it, and I wanna thank the whole team who supported me in this project because it would have not have been at all possible <laughs> without any of them. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Very interesting. Uh, do you think there's a possibility of having a, a survival effect in your older part, uh, the older part of your sample, that being older and obese, they have some protective factor that help them make it to that age? Definitely. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's very possible, and it's actually been one of the thoughts behind maybe why we don't, above the age of 75, that mortality, um, the increase in mortality associated with obesity actually tends to taper off, and we think that's probably related to a survival benefit. And it could be why, another reason why older adults who are now engaging in weight loss might be more successful because they might be the healthier of the people who would be undergoing weight loss programs. So, yeah. So uh, nice work, Corey. Uh, just a question about the uh, the underlying mechanisms why we find so often that older people f uh, find it easier to lose weight, if you want to put it this way. Uh, do you think it might have anything to do with the physio physiological response or the adaptations to weight loss that you would normally see that those systems, mm. uh, those physiological systems that protect against weight loss uh, are simply no longer active or no longer as active as they would be in a younger individual? because we see similar effects happening mm -hmm. in other physiological systems when everything from, from uh, you know, temperature control to everything else that you can think of. So do you think that this could just be the fact that older people are not defending their weight as effectively as younger people? Yeah, I, I do. Um, and I think we see that <coughs> with the unhealthy people who lose weight, especially. So they're not being protected against weight loss, whereas if I got sick and I went to the hospital, I would probably maintain my weight pretty well, whereas when we see those older adults who go into the hospital for a month, they lose a lot of weight and they don't gain it back. And yeah, so I think it's exactly, I think that's definitely a part of it. I think there's a lot of different things going on, a survival, by, a survival benefit, there's um, changes in older adults and, and they have time as well, so yeah. Right, I think uh, we've come to an end. I'd like to thank all the delegates for their excellent presentations this afternoon, and thank you all for listening. Uh, this session is now over.